So we're going to call this name that error. The objective of today is to help you identify signing agent notary errors on loan documents. So these are some of our most common errors that we see every day, every week. I compiled our, our biggest errors of this week, which was a big week for errors because it was month end on Monday. So that means that our quality control team was overwhelmed. Um, this month end, I do feel like we did really well in general. Notaries did a pretty, pretty great job. So this is just some of our common errors. It'll help you to identify errors uh, for yourself and to try to avoid them in the future. You've probably made some of these errors, so don't beat yourself up when you do. Uh, just take it as a, a experience, right, and learning lesson and move on. So how it's going to work is I'm going to show you a copy of a signed document. They may or may not have errors. So when you identify an error, raise your hand, uh, your virtual hand, and uh, Eli, who's our AV guy and my husband and coworker, he's going to call on you. So um, raise your hand and let's get started. All right. So this is the note. You'll find this in every set of refinance or purchase loan documents. This is the most important uh document for the borrower to see. This is their promise to pay. So this is a very important document. Check it out and let me know what you think the errors are. Hello. Hey, what do you think? Uh I think, well, first of all, the stamp, they're not supposed to stamp on the line. That stamp is supposed to be clear. Yeah. So good point. We'll kind of elaborate on that. But yeah, that stamp is not supposed to be there. This is the note. So except for in Virginia, you don't notarize the note. But yeah, that's the that that's right. So the stamp. There's another error. Who can identify it? All right, Linda. Hi, yeah. On page two, there's no initials. You got it. Perfect. So there you go. Those are our errors on this form. Let's go to the next slide. So yeah, so look out for hidden initials. This is a big one. Um, I don't particularly know why they're kind of small at the very bottom. You might not be looking for those initials. This is a, something that happened yesterday. On this exact form, the borrower didn't initial, the notary missed it. And so what we had to do to correct that is go back to the borrower, get this form mm -hmm. initialed, and then ship it back to the uh, lender. So that's a FedEx label. And for us, our FedEx labels cost $25. So that error it was a little bit of a hit, right? Monetarily. So yeah, don't miss hidden initials. So when you're looking at a set of loan docs, scan the whole page and generally initials are at the bottom, right? Bottom right-hand corner. So double check, make sure you get your initials. And then Athena brought out this stamp. So Virginia is the only state that the note isn't notarized, but it's certified and they need the notary to certify it. Outside of Virginia, you do not stamp the note. So you only want to stamp notarizations. So the word seal next to the borrower's signature is only referring to their signature. So don't stamp it. You don't need to stamp it. This is a real common error among new notaries. Um, if I'm quality controlling a set of docs and I see a stamp on the note where it says seal by the borrower's signature, I know you're a new notary because you see seal and you think that's referring to your stamp. But when the word seals right next to the borrower's signature line, it's just referring to their signature. So no need to stamp. Great job, ladies. Awesome. Let's go to the next, next example. So this is of a deed of trust. So this is the signature page and the notarization on the deed of trust. Your state might have a mortgage instead of a deed of trust, but deed of trust or mortgage, 
pretty much the same thing. They're always going to be present in a refinance or pretty much almost all loan signings are going to have a deed of trust. So let me know. What do you guys think? All right, David. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, so Hi. just looking at the wording, I see two things. One, the notary public did not put in their full name as it is on their stamp uh -huh. and the names that he wrote, he or she wrote in uh, should have been their complete names of Sean Gregory Jackson and Caitlin Ann Jackson in there. Got it. Perfect. That was right. Thank you. Good job. Exactly. So this is really common uh, for one of our products in particular, which is an equity product. This error comes every single day. Every day we get this error. So just to reiterate, the signer's name on the notarization must match the signature line. So just like uh, our uh, David said, it's Sean Gregory Jackson. They need to write Sean Gregory Jackson. And Caitlin Ann Jackson, same thing, Caitlin Ann Jackson. Now, uh, one of our clients informed us that you can have more on the notarization and not less. So the counties will accept that. So if, for example, the signature line was Sean Jackson, you could put, put on your notarization Sean Gregory Jackson, if that matches their ID. You can do that, but it's best to just match the signature line just to be safe. That way you don't get any rejections. And then, yep, that second one was the notary's name on the notarization must match the notary name as it appears on their stamp. Exactly. And this lender, oh, there you go. This lender actually put that inter notary name exactly as it appears on notary stamp. Not every lender is going to have that verbiage. So it's important. Your stamp, the name must match the stamp exactly. So in my case, I chose a longer name, VA, V Anna Cherubel. If you're not a notary and just want to be a notary, make your notary name small. Maybe just your first initial and your last name. Otherwise, you're going to be writing out that full notary name every time. Great job. All right, next up is um, a form that I've seen for one lender in particular. It's called the Attention Settlement Agent. Let me know what you guys see on this one. Any takers? Oh, Jennifer. Yes, there's no initials on the sections one, two, or three. Got it. Good one. So this is a, a, a little, this isn't going to be in every set of loan docs, but this is missed all the time all the time. So what happens if it's missed? Generally, escrow is not going to catch it. And maybe initially the lender won't. But we get for one client all the time, what we call like post-closing errors. So the file's already closed, the loan's funded, but they can't close out everything on the lender's end until we get these. And sometimes it's really hard to get a hold of borrowers after they've already had their loan funded, right? They think they're good. They don't need anything. They've already got the money. They're good to go. And so it can take our team weeks to get a hold of the borrowers to get these initials. So slow it down. Look for the word initial here. Great job. This is a real common error. Perfect. All right. So yeah, again, look out for hidden initials. They're going to get you sometimes. So just keep an eye out. All right. Next up is the Patriot Act. And I included two samples. So we'll start with the one on the left first. So this is a real standard Patriot Act form. This one on the left. What do you see? Take a look. All right, let's have Alice McKay. Um, on the, on the, there is no primary um, identification. So you have to check off that first ID and then write in like the state, either state ID, passport or something like that. You have to have that one first. And then the secondary ID, all those boxes need to be filled in. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so so good. So the first error on the one to the left is that they didn't select the primary ID. On this form in particular, it does say one form of ID is required. So yeah, we need that one form. Exactly. There's there's one more error on this one to the left. Can anyone identify it? All right. What about Nikita? You there, Nikita? Oh. <laughs> Hello? Hey. Hey. <laughs> um, so I see that there was signed by the borrower and not the notary. Mm -hmm. You got it. This is another super common error. Uh, notaries will think that this form is not for them. So they'll have the borrower sign it. But this one's for you. This one's for you as a notary signing agent. So this is another common one I, we see every week, maybe several times a week, almost every day. So yeah, sometimes the borrowers will sign here, but this is for you. Now we've had some back and forth, even on our classes about what your title is. I'm gonna say your official title is notary public. Um, if you put signing agent, that should be okay. You may or may not get that kicked back. I've heard some people say they've never got it kicked back. I've dealt with some lenders who have said, hey, could the, borrow, the notary put their official title as notary public? Um, either way, maybe a compromise would be put signing agent notary. That might be a good compromise. But yeah, don't have the borrower sign this one. There is one lender that I know of that requests the borrower to sign, but it's very obvious. Um, and you have to sign as well. But that's that one lender. Outside of that, I've really never seen the borrower have to sign this form. Good job. Okay, what about this other Patriot Act? Um, this is another really common uh, Patriot Act. What do you see that's missing? And one is kind of hidden. Actually, I think the only error on this one is kind of hidden. So it's a little sneaky. Hmm? Oh, Lisa. Lisa, you there? Lisa Bell? Okay, let's try it. Yes, I am. Oh, I you am there? Yes. Okay, good. Let's see. Um, let me find one. It needs two forms of ID, and yeah. there's only one listed on the form. Good job. That's it. That's the error on this one. So the very top says the named individual must present two forms of ID. So we only filled out one. Um, this is another one of those errors that might get through to funding. No one might catch it until after. And it becomes then what we call a post-closing error. Um, and, and again, it might take a while to get completed. So keep a lookout. You can use all sorts for, of ID for the secondary. So if they don't have their birth certificate, social, oh, my screen disappeared here. There you go. You, you can use their uh, a utility bill, Costco card, anything to verify that that is who they say they are. Car payment, house payment, any of those items. It, it lists here what they can use. Also, you can use a voter registration card, tax bill, utility bill, W-2. So that's all. That's a lot of different IDs that you can accept. So good job there. Perfect. All right. Next up, this is a signature name affidavit. So check this out and, and tell me what you think. All right, Teresa. Yes. Hi. Um, they didn't write in their commission expires. Yep. That's it. 
perfect. My commission expires. There's one more error on this as well. Let's see if we can catch it. All right, Katie. So on the notarization, um, mm -hmm. it says Sean Jackson instead of Sean Gregory Jackson. You got it. Perfect. Excellent. That's another really common error, just like we saw on the deed of trust, is that the notary will put an abbreviation or, or part of the name and not the entire name. So we need that full name. So let's look at this. So yeah, so the signer's name on the notarization needs to match the signature line of the document. And generally, it can be more than what's on the signature line, but not less. And if the notarization calls for additional information, so sometimes you'll see my commission expires. You'll see it'll ask for a notary serial number or ID number, which is just your commission number. Um, or maybe it'll even ask for your notary name. I'm thinking of one lender, and it has you fill in a lot of information, your principal county, um, your number. Even if the information is on your stamp, you have to manually add it if requested. So if this is missed, our clients can have you either fill in a new jurat or fill in a scan, the, cop, the scanned copy. So make sure to get this right. Another really common error that I see every single day is that they'll put their commission number expiration, but it'll be wrong. So they might put like for me, it's May 29th, 2022. But because I'm in the zone for 2021, right? I'll put 2021. And so that's another thing that'll get kicked back and we'll, and we'll need to get that one. Oh, David, do you have a question or a comment? Yes, uh, on the upper section where you have his name and then it says after being uh, by me full, first duly sworn upon oath does oppose and say that shouldn't his name be written in there as well? So generally this section here, great, great comment and question. So this section here will be filled with aliases if there are any aliases. Mm -hmm. So like in this example, there were no aliases, so it didn't have anything. If you, if the borrower or you insist on putting their name or additional aliases, that's totally fine. But if it doesn't list any, then just the Sean Gregory Jackson Jackson is all that they're, you know, promising the truthfulness to. Okay, good. Point. Thanks. Yeah. Good job, though. <laughs> okay, excellent. On to the next. Okay, so this is another signature name affidavit. So this is a real common um, format for this form to, to be. So check it out. Let me know what you see. Oh, I'm, I'm moving ahead. Oh, no. Hold on. Close your eyes. There you go. <laughs> all right. So what do you see here? All right, Katrina. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Oh, you're unmuted? You there? Make sure to, to join audio if you haven't already. Okay. All right, Arlene. Hi. Um, so he didn't sign on the left hand side like his aliases in the AKA statement. And then also on the right side um, where it says subscribed and sworn mm -hmm. the date, it has the notary name instead of his name. You got it. Excellent. Good job. So that's what this form is, right? These are the errors. So, so if there are names present in the AK, like Sean has, so he has S. Jackson, Sean Greg Jackson, and then Sean Peter Jackson. And it looks like there's a typo there too. It's like Jack on. So if names are present in the AK statement, the signer must sign for each name they have been known by. If they have never been known by a name, they must write never known as and initial. 
So what will happen is this form will come back and they didn't sign for the names, or if they're a name they've never been known by, they leave it blank. You must provide an, have the signer provide an explanation. So in this case, that Sean Peter Jacken, oh, I keep, my things keeps moving. Um, if it has it like that, never known as and have the borrower initial. And for the aliases that they're okay with, maybe those are their, their names that they go by for business or for legal reasons or their, their actual names, they need to sign for those names the way that they would sign for them. So in the top case, which is S. Jackson, he just signed S. Jackson. And with Sean Gregg, he signed Sean Gregg. So that's how you need to sign for this form. If their signature is more of like a symbol, then they can continue to produce their symbol on those signature lines. And then on the jurat, oh man, I'm all over the place. And on the jurat where it says by, this is where you add the signer's name as it appears on the form notarized. So do not put your name. That's like you're notarizing yourself, which is surprisingly a very common error. It's, it's a funny looking form. It's different than an acknowledgement, but you put the signer's name. Your name on a jurat does not appear on the form except on the signature line and your stamp. All right, Linda, what's your comment or question? I have a question. Um, so like if someone's name is misspelled mm -hmm. and they don't care, can they just go ahead and sign it or do they still have to do the never known as? If they don't care, then they can absolutely sign it. Um, I'll give you an example. I have a credit card where my name is misspelled. One of the I's in Virginia is off and I'm lazy. And so I never got a new one. And I figured, oh, this will this will work. It's no one ever questioned it when they verified my ID vers versus my um, my card. Um, so I signed for it's Virginia, Virginia for a long time. So when that appeared on my loan docs for for my aliases, I signed for it because that's I've actually signed for that name, even though it's not my name because I was lazy. Now I look back, I probably should have changed it right away, but I didn't. So if they want to sign for it because maybe they've had a credit card or a bill that was uh, accidentally included a typo in their name, they can sign for it. Or they can write never known as. It's up to the borrower and you can kind of give them that option. Great question. Okay, next up is errors and omissions compliance agreement. So what do we see here? What's missing? All right, Troy. Hi, Virginia. Hey, Troy. Um, I noticed that the venue is missing, like the state and also the county. I found yeah. the thing that's missing. Absolutely, yeah. So the venue's missing. And also There's... the stamp. Yeah. It's missing it's... in the bottom and signature and expiration date. Good job. That's it. This is one we get multiple times every single day, this error. So look thoroughly at the page that you're getting. And that's why if you get the documents early enough to prepare and prep a little bit, examine each page and memorize your notarial certificates and what they say, because in this case, it's just very hidden. Um, also, this form is, is on a legal size form. So you might print it on letter and get that cut right off. So you're not even gonna see the notarization, right? If you don't print according to PDF size or fit to page. That way you don't get anything cut off. Um, but yeah, this is missed every single day. Uh, one of our quality control people who deals with one client in particular, um, this is probably her number one error. So I asked her for samples and she could provide me with an endless amount. Truly every single day this is missed, even by the best notaries. So check the page. Um, another note, if you're in California, this jurat form doesn't include that box that's above each uh, notarization. Um, so you might want to add a loose leaf acknowledgement or get one of those stamps that has that verbiage in California. But yeah, this one's a hidden notarization. Oh, it looks like we have a, a comment or question. Linda, got a question for us? Yeah. Um, what venue do you put for that on the top of the document? The 
the one for the property or the one where you're at? So when it's blank like that, it's because it's attached to that notarization. You normally don't see the venue way up at the top um, that isn't filled out. But if it isn't filled out, you would do the venue of where you're signing. So do it like you would complete a notarization. So for where the signing takes place, you'd put that state and county. Great question. Brenesha, I hope we got that right. Yeah. Yes, you did. Thank you so much. Oh, Quick great. question for you. Um, sometimes in loan packages, I see um, verbiage from the lender asking for the signer to the borrower to sign exactly as their name appears. Mm. But some, uh, I found that some borrowers just kind of have a, I don't want to say chicken scratch, but it's not <laughs> legible. Yeah. And I find that borrowers really, really struggle, some of them, especially if their middle name appears, to sign the document exactly as it appears. So I tell them what the verbiage, what the lender requests, and I tell them I'm not here to tell you how to do your signature and do what you feel to do in your heart. I don't know yeah. how to advise them. I don't want to tell them how to do their signature, but I also don't want their loan documents kicked back because yeah. they didn't follow instructions. Yeah, yeah. That, no, that's, I say what you're saying is right. This is what I say when I'm on a signing. So we'll, I'll get their ID. That's the first thing I do is I get their ID so I can see how they signed on their ID. That's going to give me an idea of maybe what their signature is going to be, right? And then we'll start out with like a non-recordable form. So a form that if they mess up, it's not going to be the end of the world. We can swap it out easily. And then I'll look at their signature and I'll advise them the lender wants you to sign as the signature line reads. Um, so if your signature, you can see it. Like in these two's case, you can see Sean and you see a J and kind of like a squiggle. That's Sean Jackson. And then Caitlin Jackson, same thing. You can see it. You you know what those what each word is. Um, but if their signature is more of a symbol, then I actually prefer that. And I'll just say, continue to sign with your symbol. Um, because we can't really dispute if it's like a crazy squiggle, right? Like it could be anything, you know, that's their symbol. That's their name. So when it's a symbol like that, just let them keep doing that. It's only when it's real obvious what each of their names are, right? If you can see Sean and Jackson, if they asked for the middle name, we need to keep reminding them to, to use their middle name. But ultimately, we can't force the signer to sign anyway, right? So I would just let them know what is expected and review their signature. If you see the, the middle initials clearly missing, then have them squeeze it in and add it. But yes, you, you kind of have to babysit our signers, right? Um, but at the same time, we can't tell them how to sign. So we just kind of give them the guidance and then cover our backs. So whoever hired you, you might want to let them know that the borrower refused to sign with their middle initial, for example, if that happens. But great comment. Okay, we have another question. Oh, cool. All right, Randy. Um, on the venue part, so if it's filled in, but it's not where we're sitting, do we change it? So it depends on the form. Um, some forms will have the venue and it's just because that's the property venue. But if it's attached to a notarization, like in this case, then I would cross it off if it's incorrect and add the right venue. If you cross off a venue's information and it's attached to a notarization, that's a good thing. The lender's never going to kick that back, at least never that I've I've not seen it. Um, you don't want to change maybe like this is actually something that recently happened. So I want to give you this story. So this, in this case, the property address is not filled out, but most of the time on loan docs at the very top, the property address is going to be filled out, right? And that's just the subject property, the property that we're notarizing, the loan docs, right? The, that they're getting the loan on. Well, recently this happened where the borrower, someone in their household had COVID. So they decided to sign at their like sister's house. And so the notary went to the sister's house and the notary insisted on crossing out the property address on every single loan document because they didn't sign there. The borrowers were like, I don't think that that's appropriate because basically it's like crossing out the subject property on the loan. And so the borrower actually called us and stopped the signing, which was really smart of them because if they didn't, those docs would be rejected. We'd have to re-sign everything. The notary was very upset with us because she thought that it was illegal to have the 
subject property be different than the signing location. The signing location does not matter. The documents can say, for example, I could sign docs for a New York property in California. The only thing that would change is the notarizations. You wouldn't want to change the, the address on the documents. So don't change the address on the documents for the subject property that they're getting the loan on, but you can absolutely change the venue. Good one. And what about Sarah? Hey there, um, I just had a question on the part where it says uh, dated effective the 22nd day of April, but mm. they weren't signing until the 29th. Mm -hmm. I typically have them change that date and initial the change. Is that correct? So this particular date where it's right above the signature line. Yeah, you can cross that out and change it. However, now let's see on this form, it doesn't have it, but there may be a creation date right? The date that's at the top of the page. You don't change that creation date. If you're going to change that date, it's going to get rejected and they're going to need to get it re-signed. Most likely every once in a while, it'll slide and you'll get away with it, but you don't want to change the creation date. Now, some states and some lenders are date sensitive. So if you see that, it might alert you and go, oh shoot, we might need new docs. But in this case, that date that's right above these signatures, you can absolutely change that. And in fact, a lot of times this is blank. So you can add, go in and add that date. Um, when in doubt, you don't have to change it. Um, just make sure that the borrowers are signing the right date, right? Current date. The only date that you really need to worry about pre-printed date is the right to cancel. That's the date that we have to think about, which we're going to go in a few minutes and look at. But yeah, great question. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Ty. Hello again. How are you? Hey, good. How are you? Good. Um, good. Quick question. I had one before where the venue was missing up top. Okay. Um, should I handwrite that in or use a loose leaf? Because I know sometimes they don't like you handwriting stuff in. Uh, what yeah. would you suggest? Yeah, I'd say either way. You know, you if it's the venue, you can add in the venue. That wouldn't be a problem. Some lenders don't want an entire handwritten acknowledgement, but just the venue, like, cause I've seen that too, where they like, especially on this form, they won't have that venue. Right. And so it doesn't have it. So you can absolutely okay. hand okay. write that in. Yeah. Or provide a loose leaf. And that's why you always in your journal have a bunch of jurats and acknowledgements. That way you can just easily slide one in there and you know, no big deal, but yeah, great question. A diet diary. Yeah. Hey, Oh, I think we're having some technical difficulty. Okay, there you go. Hello? Hey. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Mm -hmm, I can hear you. Yeah, about the error and omission, uh, if the date is there and if we don't cross it out, it's still okay still? Or... Yeah, so like like in this case where it says dated effective this right. 22nd, if, if you don't cross that off, because that's like that was the creation date, that was when right. the docs were in this case, it wouldn't pose a problem if you didn't cross this off. Um, but in general, just be careful to uh, right. not cross off anything at the very top or else you might pro pose a problem. But in this case, it wouldn't be a, a problem, most likely. I mean, 99.9% .9 chance. Okay. Of not thank you. Yes, no thank problem. you. But most of the time, this is blank and you actually have to add it in there. Now, if you don't add it in there, it may slide, but every once in a while, our client will say, hey, this date was missed and we have to go get it redated, you know, which is not a big deal, but it's a pain, you know? All right, on to the next one. Okay, so these are some tax forms. So we have three tax forms. There are issues on all three, but they're, they might be a little different. So check it out. Let's start with this form to the left, which is a 1040. So let me oh, close your eyes again, people. I'm, I'm messing up. Hey there. Hi, Julia. You there? Yes, I am. Can okay. you hear me and see me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, on the first page, the signature part is missing and the date. Good and the, um, I think the, um, I'm, I can't see if there's an initial box next to it because mm -hmm. it's kind of um, too small. Yeah, no initial box there. That's asking for some number, but yeah, 
You got the error on the 1040. Very good. Okay, what about on the 4506 T or C? All right, Erica. You need help. Hello. Um, hey. I'm trying to get back to the screen. It's taking <laughs> me to. <clears throat> For some reason, it's taking me to the um, who's all in the Zoom. Oh, the participants? Yes, I don't know why. Okay, so yeah, if you want to minimize participants and then just kind of, you could um, expand or at the right upper left-hand corner of the screen, make the screen bigger and it should show you my screen. Okay, here we go. Okay, and I think I heard someone say that they did not sign in date, correct? Yeah, so the form on the very left, that's the 1040. So that one isn't signed. What about these two, the 4506T and the W9? Do you see any errors there? You there, Erica? You want me to pick someone else? We'll try Wanda for now, but keep trying. Okay, what was your question? So we have the 4506C and the W9. Do you see any errors on either of these forms? Okay, we'll try again. Do we have any other takers? They're kind of hidden Kevin ones. Howard. Let's try Kevin. I see the signatory attest isn't, the box isn't checked and Good. the signature and date on the W-9 isn't. Perfect. Good job. Excellent. So on the W, on the 1040, this one is missed all the time. We have one client who we have a conference call every two weeks, every two weeks. And one of the big items we talk about is the 1040s and how they're always missed. So 1040s are going to look like copies of scans because that's what they are. The borrower probably scanned their 1040 to the lender and they need a wet signature on that form. So if you see a 1040, they're hidden and they're going to look like kind of ugly like this, how it's, you can't really see it and it might be a little bit fuzzy, have them sign it. If not, someone's going to have them sign it somewhere along the line. And then here is the W-9 where it says signature of U.S. person, they must sign and date. Um, and again, sometimes this date is pre-printed and it's incorrect. So cross that off initial and have the borrower or have the borrower initial and put the correct signing date. And then on this 4506 C or T, whoever is listed on the form needs to sign. So it will say if joint return enter spouse's name, but if the lender didn't add their name, preprint their name, they don't need to sign. So only the individuals listed on the form need to sign this. And yes, just like was brought out by Kevin, this, uh, this little sneaky box. Um, for the most part, if this doesn't get and uh, checked that box. Um, maybe someone else down the line who gets the docs later might check it. They might not. They might come back to you and literally have you check it or have the borrower check it. So make sure to check it there. It looks like we've got some comments or questions. Let's Troy. Troy, go for it. Hi, Virginia. Um, so on the tax form, when they signed it, did they sign the date as today's date or like the date of the signing? Yeah. Or you, yeah. Oh, so they just sure. need a, yeah, good, good question. They might have already signed it and they just need us to sign it again using today's dates. It's just a funding requirement. Funders, 
can be wild. I mean, the things that they require can be, you know, unexpected sometimes. Um, so when you get a new tax form, have them, and it's already signed, have them re-sign it using today's date. Okay, or the yeah, signing right. date. Yeah, yeah, or, I'm sorry, the signing date, whatever the signing date is. Don't sign everything for the 30th, just yeah. the current date. <laughs> cool, okay. great job. All right. Oh, okay, let me go back. We got a comment from Randy. Uh, two questions on the 4506. Mm -hmm. One is if the, if the spouse signs it, but their name's not listed, is that a big deal? I don't think it's a big deal. Um, every once in a while, we'll get a return, um, we'll be asked to return to get this re-signed. Um, but on the 4506 TC, I don't know how often that is. Um, I'll, our, I just saw our quality control manager just jumped on. So I'll ask her during the question and answer and see if this is really common that it gets kicked back. For the most part, I don't think it's going to be an error, um, but it really depends on the lender and how picky they are. Um, on a note in general, if you have a, say, now most of the time, couples will get the loan together, right? But what if one is a non-borrowing spouse? So a non-borrowing spouse does not need to provide their tax returns. So that's why their name is generally not written on this document is because they didn't need to, for them to provide their taxes. But if you had a non-borrower sign the note or sign the loan application, that's going to be a problem. And most of the times those will get kicked back and we'll have to go back. So I haven't seen it too much on the 4506 T or C. Uh, we'll ask Hannah and see what she says, um, but don't have them sign any other forms that their name is not printed on. So like, like I said, no loan app, that's not for them. They're not on the loan, so they don't need to sign the note. But yeah, great question. Let's take All right, Jermaine. So I have a question on a 1040 it has the same social as the 40, 50, 4506. So wouldn't that have to be the same as the W9? They're going to, yeah. So just so you know, this is just a sample and this is, these are just fake social numbers, just so you know. So it, it, if you're dealing with a real set of loan docs, this is just my sample set that I created, but they're going to have the same social. In this case, I just gave these Sean Jackson has like 50 so so socials according to my docs, but yeah, they're going to have the same. So if this was truly for one signer, they're going to have the same social throughout. Yeah. Good, good question. And that's something that if there was a different social, the borrower would probably be like, that's not me, you know, and that would be a problem. So we'd probably like call our loan officer, call a loan rep, get a little direction. But yeah, in this case, just forget about these socials. They're all just made up ones. All right, what about Tamara? Hi, um, hey. I've had before where I've received the 4506 C form mm -hmm. blank, but mm -hmm. there's been two borrowers and they only give you one form. I've had where I've had like the borrower and the co-borrower sign on the joint line, is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. So sometimes what will happen, and I don't know why, um, but what will happen is in a set of loan docs, you'll have some completed 4506 T's and then some blank ones. The truth is, is that they probably don't need that blank one filled in because they already have two that are, are completed. Um, but you can absolutely have both of the signers fill in that blank one because it's blank. And so normally when you'd fill in this form, you're going to put both of the, the individuals who file their taxes together. So yeah, if you if you have a blank one and it, like you fill it in, you can absolutely have the, the co-signer co or co-borrower or non-borrowing spouse fill in this and sign it as well. Okay, one other question about that sure. too. Um, mm -hmm. I've had it also where they would have like how you have Sean Jackson's name, but then say it's Sally Jackson and mm -hmm. they have their two separate ones already pre-filled. Mm -hmm. But I've been taught before where if they sign jointly, kind of have them swap papers and they fill in the 2A section and then they sign the bottom. Is that correct? It's, if it's pre-printed, it's not necessary. And okay, I don't so think it's kind of like doing double work. Yeah, kind of, kind of. It, okay. it, the lender doesn't need it, but I don't. And like I said, well, let's ask Hannah and see what she says. Um, I don't think it'll pose a, a major problem, but it's not necessary. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. 
All right, on to the next one. Okay, right to counsel. This is a big one. I'm gonna have two copies of the right to counsel on this one. So what do you see on this right to counsel? And there's quite a few things. This is kind of a mess. So let me know what you think. All right, Brandy. Hello, everyone. Hey, Brandy. Um, okay, so first things first is actually, I was just looking at the um, they did initial the date they put in, so that's good. Mm -hmm. Um I thought that was the, okay, so wish to cancel, <laughs> do not sign there. Yeah. That is only if you want to cancel today. Mm -hmm. That's the first. Yep. And then um, how to cancel. They did not input the date midnight of with the rescission date and initial. Yes. Yes. And there's one more. Okay. Sorry. Um, no, no, no. That's, you're doing great. There's just one more and it is kind of sneaky, but look back at that first date and then look at the signature line. Oh yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Wrong, wrong, wrong date. Uh, no, sorry. Um, maybe you can point it out to me. Yeah, no, that's excellent. So you you got it all. Let's look at it. I actually had one completed correctly so we can compare them. And so just re for reference, this is what they filled in. So they had the top date being 5-3, no right to cancel date. And then they signed where it says, I wish to cancel. So let's check this out. So this is how it should have been filled in. And this happens all the time. So the top date is the transaction date. So this date needs to match the signer's date right here. In the example, the notary had the top date be the right to cancel date. So she put the right to cancel date at the very top. So the top date is the transaction date, which is the date of the signing. They did initial. So they got the initial, but they got the date wrong. And then just like you brought out midnight of, that needs to be the right to cancel date. So this will happen with, I think, new notaries is that they'll see that first missing date and they'll put the right to cancel date and they'll forget about that midnight of here at the bottom, which is really the right to cancel date where you need to put that. So if you're a notary and you don't have your right to cancel calendar with you at all times, you must be a, a bigger better pro than me. I have the right to cancel always. I have it on my computer, on my phone, and I have a physical one with me. And I reference it at every single signing. Even if I do multiple signings in a day, I can't, just don't trust myself. The way that I work is in a paranoid way. And that's just because I've seen every error and I've made every error. So I just really cover my backs. And I suggest you do that too. So yeah, so this is how you fill in that form. Oh, let me go back. So top date is the date of the signing. It's going to match the signature line date and then reference your calendar. If we're signing yesterday, the right to cancel calendar, it says that the right to cancel date is 5-3-2021. Don't forget initials. Some clients will request initials there. Sometimes they won't. When in doubt, you can initial, have the borrower initial. So when in doubt, add an initial. It's never going to get kicked back because you initialed it. On, on this form, you initial had the signer initials those dates. Don't initial everything. That actually might get kicked back. But on the right to cancel, you can have the borrower initial both of those dates, even if it doesn't call for it. And then the second error is they sign, I wish to cancel. Again, this is something we see all the time. Um, what will happen is the notary will have them sign both places and borrowers really want to sign the I wish to cancel, even if they don't wish to cancel. If you give the borrower the document, they see their name and it's just like automatic. They're in the zone, right? So I've heard notaries that actually put a sticky note on that spot and say like, don't sign here. That's not a bad idea. When I'm out of signing, I cover that spot and, and point mm -hmm. to the spot where they sign. So one signature right where it says acknowledge receipt. And I'm going to mention it. Yeah. Oh, is that Lisa? 
I wanted to bring out that you, we know that this happens with new signing agents and what I find is it really happens to everybody because sometimes we may be busy notarizing a previous document and then you realize the borrowers have gone ahead of you and made a disaster of it and you don't notice it. And so it's real important that you control the documents as a signing agent so that they, the borrowers don't do something on accident and it go unnoticed. Great point. I'll tell you a real life story that happened to me. And this was not long ago. So I've been a notary for 10 years. I was nine years at that time. This was a year ago. And it was a right to cancel that was three pages. So the first page had the dates. The second page had the I wish to cancel portion. And the third page had the acknowledgement of receipt. And I was because I've been doing it forever. So I, you know, thought I was really good. And I was having too much fun at a signing, which I do every single signing. I have way too much fun. I love getting to, to know my neighbors. And I had them sign the second page and the third page. I didn't check it when I quality controlled. I didn't catch that error. Um, a few days later, our quality control team didn't catch it, which is actually an easy fix. All you do is pre print out that second page again and swap out and toss this, you shred the second page that was signed but our quality control team didn't catch it. And then the lender caught it and the borrower was super upset and even said, this notary has no idea what they're doing. I don't want them to come back to my house. So I couldn't even fix it. And of course, I think I cried about it, of course, because it, I took it real personally because I made that mistake and I knew better. So just like Lisa said, new notaries are going to make that mistake, but even really good notaries who are just overconfident are going to make that mistake. So slow it down. This is the most important form for you to get right. So Get it right. And also, and also, oh. Hannah made a point in the chat. Um, most states will tell you that you should be notarizing in front of the borrowers, and so it is true that is most states will say that. So it's important that I, I know some notaries that actually do it at home because they want to pay attention to what the borrowers are doing, as Hannah brought out. So it's important that you watch the borrowers signing every page. So if you want to notarize after the fact at their home, I we understand that or whatever way that you feel is best as long as you're watching what's happening. Yeah, and, and Elizabeth White, who um, has been with us for many years and is pretty a pretty awesome signing agent. She has a comment, I believe. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to mention also about the notice of right to cancel that um, some lenders have it really obviously where you should fill in the dates, but other lenders don't have any blank lines and it's not filled in. So you should always make a habit of looking at the notice of right to cancel, checking the dates, whether they need to be filled in, whether they're already filled in or whether they're filled in with an incorrect date already because the date of signing is different. So always check your right to cancel on each package. Great point. You never know, every lender's different. I've had a notary say, well, can't you tell the lenders to all use the same form? And oh boy, do I wish we could do that, but we can't. And the reason why is that the, the doc drawing systems are different. There's many of them. That's a whole vendor, a whole industry of just people who format Gen, you know, generic forms that they can then give to our clients who then fill them in with the signer's information. So you never know what you're going to get. Like Elizabeth said, look at the forms, slow it down. It's your responsibility. If you miss the dates, if they're pre-printed and you miss them, that's your fault. That's what they're going to say. Linda's going to be mad at you and us, you know, and if you're working with Coast Coast, they're gonna be mad at us. So slow it down. It's your responsibility. Great, great. That was awesome. Okay. Let's look at another one. So this is another common sample of a right to cancel. What do you think's wrong here? Take a good look. All right, Katie. Well, the transaction date is dated wrong, which of course has the uh, rescission date incorrect as well. You got it. Very good. That's it. So if the dates are pre-printed, make sure they reflect the signing date. If they do not have the signer correct and initial, and again, always reference your right to 
cancel calendar or rescission calendar. Um, just a quick note, some lenders do not allow corrections on docs. So if the date is wrong, then that shows us that the docs are wrong. But that's very rare. I, I'm thinking of two lenders out of the hundreds that we work with. Um, but for the most part, if the dates are wrong, you go ahead and correct them. So that's what we did here. The borrower crossed off that date. We directed them to put in the signing date. Again, that date matches the, the borrower's signature date. And then you look at your calendar and, and yesterday's right to cancel was the 3rd of May. Excellent. Very good. All right, we're going to look at loan applications. I believe these are our final two or two forms that we're going to look at. This is the new version, which by the way, me and Elizabeth White were doing quality control. Was it last Monday, this Monday? I don't remember the weeks all blur together. Um, and I was quality controlling these forms and it stressed me out every time because every lender is a little bit different, but there is a format that they follow. So looking at these two forms, what's missed? All right, Melissa. Hello? Hey. Hi. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, I, it's hard for me to see, but um, I can, it looks like there's only one borrower, so it shouldn't be initial because it's not a joint application, correct? So that's a good point. This case, there is joint credit. Oh, yeah, it's this. I know it's super tiny, probably. And depending on what you're looking at this on, it's probably super tiny. So, so in this case, they are applying for joint credit. Okay. What's missed? Okay, so he needs to put his initials. Yep, very good. Excellent. So if they're applying for joint credit, now each borrower is going to have their own right or own loan application. So Sean needs to initial right there. Right. And okay. then on section six, they both need to sign. And then, oh, am I going too far? No, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. They both need to sign and then he'll need to sign the addition or somebody else will need to uh, initial the additional borrower form. Yeah. So this one is the, every lender is different. So, but there, but it is. So it's section one. So let's go to this. So section one will require an initial if the borrower is applying for joint credit or there are multiple borrowers. So you got mm -hmm. that one. Excellent. And then section six, like I said, I thought that it was the one way and everyone was going to use the same kind of form, but I've actually discovered that's not totally the case. So in this case, it only calls for one borrower signature and date, but I've seen other right to cancels that under, or I keep going back to the right to cancel other loan applications are 1003 where it has both borrowers to sign. So again, just like the right to cancel, slow it down, see what this lender is requiring. So in this case, it just requires that one initial and that one signature. But I've seen other forms where there's the co-borrower signature as well. So very, very good job. This one is a pain, right? It's like right when I was getting comfortable with the old 1003, they switched it up on us, but that's okay. Slow it down. Again, remember the rule is that section one has an initial if there are multiple borrowers and section six should have a, a signature. There may be additional signatures. Um, depending on the borrower and their specific uh, information. Um, but general rule, section one, section six. So re verify. This is another one where you'll slow it down and verify. Okay, what about this loan application, which is much more comforting to me? This is what I'll call the original 1003. These are three pages of it. It's normally four or five, four or five pages. So what do we see here and what, what do we need done? All right, Thea. Hello. So uh, top of page one, borrow and co-borrower signatures. Good and job. then above the big X in the middle on page two, there was both of their names and dates. Uh -huh. And then on the bottom of three, same thing, both are per names and dates. Perfect, good job. All right, so I think I, I just, we had this one, oh, hold on, let's see forward. Yeah. So, so exactly. So the borrower is to sign at the top of the first page. Now there's been a little bit of dispute because technically what it says here is that if this is an application for joint credit, borrower and co-borrower co each 
agree that we intend to apply for joint credit here. So sometimes if there's just one borrower, this will come back unsigned. And technically that's not an error. However, we have had our lenders kick it back and say that's an error and get it, get it signed. So when in doubt, just have it signed. Just have it always signed here at the top. It's never going to be an error if it was signed when it didn't need to be signed. And then there is this kind of sneaky hidden signature about what, three quarters of the way down? Must sign there. Um, sometimes I'll see the borrower sign where it says loan originator signature. Remember, they're the borrower, so they'll sign above that. Just like Thea said, above the big X there. And then the third page, this is another common error is where they'll sign at the very, very top. That's actually not where they need to sign. They need to sign at the very, very bottom. So there you go. All right. So that's the end of our little game there. You guys did so good. I'm super impressed. We have some great signing agents attending our class. I'm really honored. Thank you. If you didn't know those, rewatch this and you'll learn, right? It's all about experience and um, uh, getting familiar with the docs. So take advantage of whatever docs that you have. Um, and these videos are a great resource. So oh, I think that we have a comment. All right, Monica. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, real quick. I have a question about the uh, 1003, the new form. Okay. So like I had one the other day, it was like a husband and wife and their son. And so my question is about the initial. So are they all supposed to initial on all pages since they're all signers or how does that work? Because you know, the husband and wife mm -hmm. was on the first half and then the mm -hmm. son was on the second half with his mm -hmm. application. So this, the, the simplest way is to have each signer initial just their application. So if we have three borrowers, they're each going to have their own, you know, there's, they're going to each have their own section, which is the long application. So they're going to each have like their own, like 10 page application. Um, and they only really need to initial just above or underneath where their names are. Um, you can have them all initial each of those spots on all three of their applications though. So again, that's not going to be a problem if you over initial the 1003. Um, but technically all that's required is just an initial for the person that the application belongs to. So in this case, Sean and Caitlin are, are applying for joint credit. Only Sean needs to initial his application and only Kate, Caitlin needs to initial her application. But if you had them all initial, it's, I'm going to say not going to pose a problem. Most likely not going to pose a problem. Great question. Okay. So... Okay, so we'll take some more questions after. Um, let's just go over just our pro tips just to kind of reinforce what's going to help you avoid errors. So the best way to avoid making errors, errors is triple checking your documents prior to shipping. So while you're signing, I'm checking the documents. Before I leave, I slow it down and say, I need to take just a few minutes to make sure we didn't miss anything. And then before I ship, I do my third and final check. Um, beware of overconfidence. This is the pattern. Notaries are nervous at first and they do a beautiful job. And then they think that they're good because they are good because they haven't made any errors yet. And they stop triple checking their docs and they'll start making errors. Um, one of my favorite signing agents is a friend of mine and sh that she fell into that same pattern. And in one month she made an error on like maybe, I don't know, five or six files. And then she started getting right back into that triple checking. So you want to always prepare like you're new and like you're going to make an error, just like I said. And it's kind of one of my, my business philosophies is that I'm paranoid all the time. I assume that myself and everyone else is going to make an error. So I work in a way to try to prevent that. And I suggest that to anybody. Um, and then if there are any issues at the signing table, you need to communicate them. So if the borrower refuses to sign a form, call the contracting company. And then when you update the website, like for when you're working for us or really any other contracting company, put the reason and what happened in writing to cover your back. Because in a week from the signing, uh, you might get an email saying, why didn't this form get signed? You need to go back. Maybe the borrower refused or it doesn't apply to the borrower. We need to know that at the signing while it's happening. So provide real-time updates. And if slash win, because you're going to make errors. Everybody makes errors. I told you some of my errors that happened within the past year. 
take accountability and fix the error immediately. It's not easy to be told you did something wrong, right? We can get defensive. We can get sensitive. Take accountability and fix it. If you do that, no one's going to be mad at you or they're not going to stay mad long, right? What can you do when you say, I'm so sorry, I'll fix it? Everyone's going to go, oh, okay, great. That's what we want to hear. Um, do not delay in getting the correction fixed. So if you have a busy day, rearrange your day to fix that error first because delays, funding delays can occur from errors, rate lock extensions that cost our signers, our clients, and our signing companies money, and ultimately possibly you. If we have to create a FedEx label on your error, you're going to pay for that label. And we want you to make as much, as much money as you can make, right? So take accountability. That's all I want to hear. Um, we've had times where notaries will make an error, but the way that they fix it, it, we forget about the error. We're just so impressed that they fixed it. They took accountability and they got it done. You don't need to grovel. We're all going to make errors. Just say, oh, so sorry. I'm on it. I'm fixing it. And we're going to be happy and you're going to keep getting work. And don't forget that we're here for you. So if you have questions just in general, reach out to training at C2C signings. If you have suggestions for future classes, we want to hear them. So reach out to us. We're here for you.